All right, thanks so much. Really excited to have David Houston with us, our head of, head of sales at Remote First. And yeah, this is gonna be a, a fun conversation around onboarding and paying globally distributed talent. So Dave, let's start off just uh, with, with a quick intro about you and Remote First. Sure. Thanks, Max. Thanks for having me, and and we're of course very proud to be uh, you know a part of the session today. Um, one of the things Max and I have not met in person, but we live about a mile from each other in Boston, so it's good that we flew all the way to San Francisco to get together in person. Um, but yeah, uh, my my I'm head of sales and, and marketing at Remo First, and we're a company that help people hire talent in 150 countries around the world. Um, and we're going to talk more about the complexities of that. Um, but I've been with Brimo First for about seven months now, but in the HR uh, and international expansion space for about 15 years. So, Amazing. And so, as you said, pretty new role for you at Remo First, so offering employer of record services and compliance solutions for companies that have globally distributed teams. So quite a few of those companies in, in the house today. So for those in the audience who aren't int intimately familiar with that concept, can you just break down what an employer of record is? Yeah, sure. So... I think, you know, traditionally there were two ways in which companies would, would think about hiring talent globally. And um, the first, the most traditional way that companies think about is physically expanding, you know, their offices globally. So you might have a, a multinational company like Google who wakes up one day and says, you know what, we're going to plant a flag in a country like the UK and we're going to set up an, a, an entity there and we're going to pay taxes there. And then through that entity, we'll now, uh, we'll now hire people. Um, but the problem that creates is it's very time consuming and, and very complex and you know for well resourced organizations who have a lot of time on their hands it's it's a great way to go but for most companies who maybe want to hire a developer or a head of sales uh, it can be a, a very expensive proposition and it's like you know trying to kill an ant with a with a sledgehammer. Um, the other path that companies would take would be to engage independent contractors so it's sort of the shortcut approach of saying. You know, I, I met you on Friday, I want to pay you on Monday, and I think you have a special skill that can help develop my business, and so let's just put a paper contract together and, you know, I'll start wiring you money when you, when you do good things. Um, that can work and, and should be a part of people's strategy when it comes to engaging talent globally, but that also has its limitations. And you have uh, people who run into compliance issues around that. There's all sorts of things around employee misclassification, um, and in addition, there are a lot of candidates all around the world who would never want to engage with a U.S. company, for example, in that method, right? You want more assurances. You want more um, security through, like, a, a traditional employment contract. So employer of record kind of sits at the, the nexus of those two ends of the spectrum, which is this nice compromise of having entities in 150 countries around the world that you can employ talent through. So you have a more W-2 style employment relationship with your employer. You're just doing it through the employer of record. So you can do it quickly. You can do it in five to seven business days. And you can do it without any of the complex headaches of setting up entities or any of the compliance risk of, you know, engaging independent contractors who might actually be employees if somebody was really looking into it. So, you know, something that I've heard repeatedly from U.S. companies is that they have consciously avoided hiring full-time employees from outside the country because they're worried about running into international payroll processing issues that can be problematic to their business from a legal standpoint as well. And there's, you know, founders, co-founders in the audience today who are actively looking for international talent. So how would you say they best educate themselves on the complexities and regulations that are involved in hiring talent in multiple countries around the world? So, you know, I think a lot of the conversation today has been about, you know, having remote teams and, and what comes along with that and, you know, professional development and enablement. But it all starts with, with payroll and, and contracts, right? You have to start somewhere. And, you know, I think it's right to have concerns around the legal and, and compliance aspects of things because even though the whole world went remote a couple of years ago, it's not as though foreign governments all got together and said, hey, you know, let's make it really easy for people to hire across borders. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of the boundaries that have always been in place actually still exist. And so it's about, you know, what, uh, what can companies do to, to try to navigate that? Um, so, you know, I guess as far as educating themselves, the, the first thing that I would advise people on is, um, you know, throw out your U.S. handbook. So there, there are a lot of organizations that when they think about first engaging talent, even if it's in some place like Canada that we think is very familiar to us, where they say, I'll just 
send them my US offer letter and I'll communicate my US comp plan and I'll probably offer a, a US style benefits package. And while that's nice in theory, it creates all sorts of problems. And you know, the, the problems could range from one, uh, if you do it improperly, you actually could at that point open yourself up to significant legal and compliance risk, which I can get into more detail around. But there's also a candidate on the other side of this conversation who expects you as the potential employer to really understand their environment. You know, what is it like to live and work in Portugal and what kind of benefits would somebody who lives in Portugal expect? And maybe the person in Portugal expects their comp plan to be communicated to them in euros and not US dollars. And so the best thing you can do is slow down, throw out the US handbook, and then seek out you know, partners for advice on these things. So if you have an idea of the types of benefits that you might want to offer to a full-time employee in P Portugal, try and understand what is already covered as a part of your employer taxes in Portugal, for example. And maybe offering private medical insurance is completely unnecessary or, uh, or not relevant. And don't try to put things in foreign contracts that apply in the US. Maybe for you and I living in Boston, it might be quite common to have a, a non-compete or non-solicit agreement in our employment contract. Not in California, of course, but, uh, but in most parts of the world, those are either illegal or unconstitutional, right? So you need to think that through. And then you can also like unintentionally add a bunch of things into a, a, an offer to an employee that maybe then when it comes time to terminate that employee, let's say two years down the line, you're looking to move on or whatever it may be, um, you might have opened yourself up to all sorts of risk and cost because you agreed to something on the front end that you never should have. Right. Um, and then just the last really important piece is that if you think that by taking you know, a drafted US employment contract and handing that to someone in Portugal that that will somehow uh, stand up to, you know, a Portuguese court of law, it won't, you know, and you're gonna be in a difficult position. So um, again, throw out the US handbook, slow down and, and get good advice before proceeding with any of those types of conversations. So as a follow-up to that, also wanted to talk about just, you know, from where you sit, what are the phases that a company has to think about as they go through setting up international payroll for the first time? So I think back to you know the first point about you know there are still multiple ways in which you can engage an international team and so I think considering the various options and saying based on the type of work that this individual is going to be doing for you could an independent contractor agreement actually be relevant so for example is this someone who has a, a specialized skill that is going to be fulfilling a need for your organization but maybe you only need them 17 hours a week and, and maybe you're perfectly comfortable with them uh, engaging other you know, clients with other types of work uh, or is it somebody that you do need you know, full time and then from there try to understand what are your business objectives in that jurisdiction. So uh, is this a salesperson, is this a developer, is this a, a person who's gonna be delivering customer service and support and so by understanding kind of the, the role the individual is gonna be playing and the needs you have as a business, now you can start to settle on, do I need an entity? Is that totally unnecessary? Is a contractor agreement relevant? Or would an employer of record be the right approach? Once you've discovered that, I think then engaging with some experts in either one of those categories before you communicate with the candidate is key. Because if you go and try to sit down across the table from that candidate and start negotiating what an employment relationship is gonna look like, without having, having taken that step first, that's where problems will start to arise and, and, and ultimately you might risk losing the candidate. Uh, from there, the legal contract is the thing I would focus on next. So what are the components of an employment contract in this country that are, that are very important? And I don't know how technical we wanna get, but you know, <laughs> focusing on things like thinking worst case scenario, like what if I have to, to fire this person in six months? Like what, what kinds of things do I put in the contract to allow me some flexibility where that does not create significant additional costs for my business or open me up to potential legal downside? So you can put in place things like probationary periods and other terms that give you some flexibility on the front end before you engage an employee. Um, from there, you know, thinking about salary and currency and you want to ensure that the individual receives the exact same amount of dollars each month? Well, you got to think about that because the US dollar and the euro are constantly evolving against each other. And so those are the kinds of considerations you may want to take into account. 
Um, another thing that I think is really important while we're on the topic of currency is just the cost of, of engaging employees in these foreign countries. Um, you know, I think there is a maybe a misconception that, you know, it's, it's just very expensive to engage employees overseas because we see that uh, employer taxes are actually high in, in relative to the U.S. Um, but in fact, there are a lot of benefits included for employees in those employer taxes that we then cover in, through like private medical and other things here in the U.S. So having a, a sense of the total employer cost uh, before you go in so you're not surprised then a few months down the line of like how much you're actually paying for this new employee in this new country I think would be a great, great step as well. So, you know, over the past couple of years, we've seen this massive increase in the number of folks who are full-time remote employees, contractors. Um, many of them become digital nomads. They live in multiple countries throughout the course of the year. So from that standpoint, in terms of compliance, taxation, compensation issues, what type of you know, issues does that pose for companies who are going about the process of hiring folks who are digital nomads? Yeah, so I think digital nomads, like, first of all, this isn't something new as of COVID, as you know. I mean, people have been doing this for, for many years. Uh, there were a lot of trendsetters out there prior to COVID. Um, but to give you an analogy of, like, what happened during COVID, like, I, I bought a car during COVID. And it was right at the, 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 heat of, uh, the height of COVID, I should say. And, and when I was done, you know, with the financing component of it, they basically let me drive the car off the lot without, like, plates or a registration because everything was closed. They were just like, you know, we'll figure it out later. And, and there were a lot of different, you know, I think formal processes like that that we would all engage various government uh, officials for that, that um, everybody kind of just waved their hands during COVID and said it's fine. And I think there, there's a, an analogy here to the digital nomad thing, which is everybody was like, it's fine. Like, I'll just travel all around the world. I'll spend a couple months here, a couple months there. No one's going to check. And I do think increasingly, as we go forward post-COVID, more governments are going to start to try to, they want taxes paid, right? So if you're going to go and live in Costa Rica and sit on the beach and you're there for longer than six months, the Costa Rican government is going to say, okay, like I need, you know, payroll taxes or I need you to start, you know, the, the employer potentially to start paying for those things. So I think it's important as the employer to, you know, while you may want to embrace that type of opportunity for some of your employees, I think you have to be very clear as to what the potential downsides are for you and, and that you can't necessarily just leave it up to the individual to understand how long can they be in a country what types of documentation or, or visa status should they have, depending on how long they're there, what taxes would they owe as a result of that, and potentially the risk that could open you up to as an organization. The UK has a, a law uh, on the books called IR35, which pertains to um, independent contractors, for, for example, and it says that if, if you're an independent contractor working for my organization and you don't pay taxes that are, that are owed as an independent contractor, even though I don't directly employ you, I might be liable for the back payment of taxes. So those kinds of things should be taken into account. In general, I think the proper way to engage a digital nomad probably is through an independent contractor arrangement. Because if you're trying to decide which country that person is domiciled in and therefore which uh, government's employment laws should dictate, you know, in the case of, of a dispute, that can get very complex uh, and can create a lot of headaches for you. Um, so, you know, to the extent that you can figure out a way to, you know, retain them as an independent contractor and not go down the, the direct employment route, I think that's probably the right way to, to approach it. But of course, you know, every, every situation varies. For sure. And then just, you know, as a follow-up to that, just in, you know, conversations that you've had with, you know, customers, with, with clients, are there you know, any that are taking any particular, particularly like interesting approaches to working with digital nomads that have been successful? Yeah, I think there, there have been some organizations that have basically um, tried to understand the landscape a bit better and they, they put, you know, in, a, in a kind way, put the onus on the digital nomad to say, look, we are fine if you want to live in these, these various countries, but let's understand the total compensation package that we're willing to pay you and therefore, you need to figure out, is that going to work for you in Berlin versus in Mexico City versus, you know, in Sao Paulo? And that the additional costs that could be there for the, for the employer are going to be borne by the employee. So 
you know, if I'm gonna pay you $100,000, that's all you're getting. Like, that's the total compensation I'm willing to provide you. And if your $100,000 turns into $60,000 in Sao Paulo or it turns into $80,000 in Berlin, that's on you. You need to figure out the rest. Um, it can be difficult if you're trying to manage that across a large population of your employees, but that is some of what we've seen. Um, and then organizations like ours and, and some other folks in our space, we're also offering benefit to the employee. So we love engaging digital nomads, like it's a, it's a part of what we're trying to help enable. Um, so we'll sometimes give them pricing discounts or bonuses and things like that if they use Remo first or you know, to, um, to be paid as they're traveling around the world. So at the outset, you mentioned you've been working in this space, helping teams expand globally for about 15 years. So from the vantage point where you sit, especially in this new role within Remote First, what would you say have been the most noticeable evolutions that you've seen from hiring and onboarding strategy, um, especially in the first, over the last few years since the start of the pandemic? Yeah, there have been, I mean, obviously a ton of changes. I think Dr. Bloom pointed that out at the beginning of the day of just like what a, a massive shift we've seen in general. But, you know, I think the thing I would start with is that this idea of global expansion used to be something that was sort of reserved for like boardroom conversations and like, is 2023 gonna be the year that we you know, expand beyond the US or whatever it may be? And, and now I think people have woken up to the fact that this can be a part of your strategy really from day one or you know, we're a 100% remote company and, and our team is across, I don't know, 13 different countries, even though we're a small 50 person team. Um, so the idea that it doesn't have to be this like fully thought out business plan that has, you know, a budget, budget assigned to it, that has shifted dramatically. Um, I think the other thing, uh, in 2021 and 2022, because of the pandemic, we all realized we could do this, right? Like if, if somebody can be working from home in Boston, then what's the difference if they're sitting in, in Romania, uh, other than time zone, of course. But so it was also about a scarcity of talent. It's like, well, I can't find these people in my backyard, wherever I may be, Chicago, Boston, LA, New York. Um, so I might as well cast the net more wide. What I do think is gonna start to happen is that organizations are gonna think more strategically about the advantages of, of hiring global teams for budget reasons. So I think every organization, especially organizations that have a board, are getting tough questions about spend and um, customer acquisition costs and all of those wonderful things. And one way you can address that is by hiring the same qualified talent in various areas of your business, but doing it at a much lower cost because you're going to parts of the world where uh, the average cost of a developer, as obviously Touring is very familiar with, or the average cost of a sales executive or an SDR or a customer service person could be a third of that of what you might pay in some part of the United States. And so I think that being a strategic or um, you know, an, an advantage that companies can, can take as they move forward would be a big change, I expect. The last thing I would say on that is, I think you know, we started talking about payroll, and because payroll is the thing that kind of drives the, the conversation, right? How do I get this person paid? Now, I think the conversation has expanded much broader than that. So, instead of just offering payroll and benefits to an employee in a foreign country, now also this whole ecosystem of benefits has popped up of you know, device delivery, for example. Like people underestimate how hard it is to get a laptop in the hands of a new employee that you hired in Cairo. Um, and then from there, organizations being able to get their teams together for offsites. You know, there are companies that are popping up to help support that kind of engagement. Um, so I think just the innovation in the ecosystem around just how to engage global teams, how to provide additional benefits and support to them is something that you know, will continue to grow, in my opinion, you know, in the year ahead. So let's talk a little bit more about 2023. Yeah. So how do you think that 2023, especially in this current macroeconomic climate, how is that gonna impact how companies go about the process of you know, looking to hire international talent? Well, I, <clears throat> I think in general, they're gonna be a bit more discerning in terms of like what it's gonna cost them. Sure. I, I do think, a lot of people threw caution to the wind in, in this sort of boom time that we've been in of like, eh, whatever it costs, it's fine, you know, this is great, we'll, we'll bring on this next person. I think now they are, you know, back to my earlier advice, they are slowing down a little bit and going either, you know, I really do wanna have a, a good sense of what my total employer costs are gonna be for engaging talent in country A versus country B. Um, so, you know, thinking a little more strategically about the country that they're hiring people in, 
um, and, and what the potential downsides are there from a cost perspective and, and compliance perspective. Um, in addition, I think in terms of the people they partner with or the way they go about it, I think they're going to be a bit more discerning, discerning on that uh, and, and being a little more cost conscious. Um, so I think that is a, a big part of it is just that strategic thought of around cost because I think that's just on everyone's mind right now. Yeah. And then just you know, as a quick follow to that, so we've seen a lot of you know, interesting markets emerge just mm -hmm. you know, from a geographical standpoint over the, the past couple of years. So yeah. which is kind of interested in knowing just within your own you know, customer or client ecosystem, um, if there is you know, demand for certain talent in certain regions that you're seeing grow you know, exponentially over the past couple of years. For sure, I think, and, and I had a conversation with some of your your colleagues about this last night, and I think it actually our experience mirrors a little bit of what what touring has seen. But places like Latin America are definitely on everyone's radar. Um, part of the issue that we've all encountered, you know, as we've grown global teams, is the time zone concern. Uh, we have an amazing team in in Eastern Europe. Uh, doing a lot of development and customer success work, but you know there are inherent challenges just in the time zone. And uh, you know, from from Boston to Kazakhstan, for example. Uh, so Latin America provides the benefits of you know talented workforce and various aspects of, of business, but uh, a much more relevant time zone for people on the east and west coast of the U.S. Um, so that's been been something that we've seen. Eastern Europe continues to be a, a place of hot demand. Uh, of course, because of what's going on in Ukraine, you're seeing right. other jurisdictions start to pop up as being like the next Ukraine, right? Um, you know, with that, the costs have risen in some of those locations for some of those roles as well. Um, but then, you know, there's still like insatiable demand for mobility across Europe. You know, Portugal, everybody loves Portugal right now. Everybody yeah. wants to move to Portugal. Uh, that we're seeing a lot of interest there. Um, but yeah, it's for us, Eastern Europe and Latin America, I would say would be the two hot spots as far as people saying, I think I want to expand my engineering team and I'm not sure how to do it, where should I go, right. um, you know, so.